Holy Whoa. moly. This is a Cosworth XD. This is a 2.65 liter V8. It's a flat plane crank pushing upward of 900 horsepower to the wheels. But this, this isn't Cosworth. This is also not even a race team. We're a bunch of half-ass YouTubers taking on a motor like this. I want to make it very clear. I have literally never torn down a piston motor before. We're gonna go ahead, disassemble this motor, show you the secrets of what Cosworth had running back in the 1990s in attempts to get this car running as quick as possible. This is not my four rotor. This is literally a project car meant to make some crazy 14,000 RPM noise. To get the engine out properly, a couple of the current IndyCar and F1 teams have reached out privately and taught me a lot of things about how to lift the car. So one of them is that we'll create a plate off of the front that will allow us to quick jack. I mean, you could take like this like triangle shaped jack and pick up the whole car from that, or basically a hydraulic jack that this huge thing that sits right in here that picks it all up. And then what we're gonna do is create these two little winglets. And you can put two jack stands on so it prevents the thing from rolling side to side as we muscle it or do whatever else. Thanks to Pitlane Spares, the guy that runs that, I know that these holes are in a very specific spot. So we aren't doing it on the CNC machine, but within reason, that's in the center of each of the punches. We're not gonna expect perfection out of it, but we'll drill the holes slightly wider because this is not a mission critical piece. It's just simply holding the weight of the car. Let's see how much things wiggled a little bit, especially with the drill walking and doing as much as I could to stabilize that. Okay, what do you think? You think it's gonna work? I think so. At least the first one should. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. You got two? There we go. Let's start. Well, that is the plate all the way onto the car. Now these bolts have a little bit of a shoulder bolt meant for the front nose. So we'll make sure we have spacers for that as well. But that is nice and on there. And you can see like on these, I, with a drill, I nailed them pretty solid. And then I had to give a little bit of tolerance for these here. But again, they're well within the bolt head. So that's not a huge deal. It'll be evenly supported. And then we'll also make probably from here outward, almost make this like a huge hanger without the coat hook. Triangulated here, triangulated here. So we have a jacking point and then we have jack stand points. You guys might have guessed it. This is my uh, bench. I can't. I can't. Oh. I'm planning to make sure that we can have two of the bigger size jacks here, and this somewhere in the middle. So uh, Isaiah's over there doing all of his dynasty fancy things. I'm gonna bust out the Multimatic 220. I rarely get the chance to MIG, so that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And Isaiah can't stop me. No, those are mine. Oh, those are mine. There's six pairs in here. That's no, a, that's no a, there's 12 so gloves in here. The thing is, you can't split those up. Those are all, you have to use them all or, or not all. I, 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 no. I have you, <laughs> well, because my, yes, I, I worked through them, so I didn't know what they, how long these have lasted. They look like that. worn in like a baseball glove. Yeah, they, they, yeah. they, they kind of are. You see, they, they conform to, to the fingers. Mine are kind of like stuck like this, though. I don't know how they got formed like this. <laughs> I know what I'm missing. What? <laughs> the cool thing about MIG welding is it has all this rod in here. And all you do is point and shoot. Them. You don't have two things going on at once. It's just feeding through here. Yeah, press the button. What's the number one thing that you need when you're welding, though? Um, power. Power. Gas. That's number two. <laughs> There's two different types of gas you can use. You use pure argon when you try to do like stainless steel stuff and make it look nice. But when you're doing stuff like this, it's 75% argon, 25% carbon dioxide. And that's just good for MIG welding. We have 30 thou of wire, which I'm assuming is the same that was in there. Uh, it says eighth inch material, which is roughly where I'm at. <laughs> that's honestly basically all I really think you need. God, that's so damn easy. That is, yeah. that's cheating. That is cheating. I'll do the rest. Who thinks we should let Joel <laughs> fuck this up? <laughs> It's only the NG car, Joel. And just hold it there for like it, how it's long? literally it, point and shoot. shoot. Yeah. yeah. Mind yeah. you guys, Joel has never welded in his life. Oh nice. 
damn. That's that's how simple it is. You want me to finish it? You could, yeah. you could start start over there. You always start away okay. and you come to you. For your first time, that wasn't that bad. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Show them how it's done. Hell yeah. It's such a different process. Show you the nice way yeah. of getting a nice mid -roll. You got those beads going. I gotta remind you guys that we do not change any of these settings. I, no. I can switch these settings up for exactly how I weld and it could come out a lot nicer. There we go. That is a pretty happy beginning. I was gonna make this whole thing to pick it up, but I don't care enough at this moment. <laughs> it's a little sketchy. Yeah, that's the whole point of that front part that I wanted to put on there. Were you recording? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's how you do it. <laughs> that was a moment of beauty. So that should prevent the car if I'm like, working on all the way up here. Yeah, look at that. It is time to test this car. We're not gonna use it for the motor, just we're gonna take the whole rear off in the most professional way we've ever done. I'm actually leaving the tires on because otherwise it just puts too much pressure on the brake. It is a lot easier to work on from up here. This should be as simple as just pulling them apart. Should be. Should be. We missed some bolts. Yeah, so we definitely have to make a like stand for the transmission to sit flat on a table. That way we're not putting weird pressures like this. Look at how bad that is. The whole thing's being held on by one bolt. That's not my favorite. We've got it wedged a little bit better, which should make it easy just oh, to... Oh yeah. At least we're on the right path. This is a new thing for us. Yeah, you can see if you have it at a slight wrong angle, look at what it does to the threads. It... Ooh. Yep. That's why they have exact stands with these sort of things. Like there's no guesswork because Slightest angle, you're wasting tons of time and efficiency and wasting a lot of energy. So let's see what happens when we lower this. I don't think we'll get lucky and the wheels will touch the ground. I think we'll be close though. Yeah. There you okay, go. There we go. Set this down gently. Damn, not easy. But here we are. Okay, so there we go. The chassis is properly supported. So we're distributing the force on this. And you can see the car is actually up on an angle. And we're gonna bring the chassis down until this height equals that height. And actually, the height that the, the uh, this whole thing's at right now is actually almost perfect. We are 100% sitting this motor on my engine mounts, and what is really nice is that they designed these mounts, which I copied, essentially, to have those locating pins. So I don't have to take all eight or nine of these off, I can just take the two off. Right now, the entire motor is sitting on just my engine mounts. These are actually remnants from the four rotors rear suspension. For some of you longer time fans, you will know that that is 7075. So this metal is meant for this. And I overbuilt them. You, if you look at the pictures, which are, there's like two in the world of these motor mounts, you'll see that uh, I added extra material. So for the handful of you guys that are like, that's not gonna work, you get yourself killed. <laughs> sure. And then there was one guy that was like, okay, well yeah, you added extra material, that's supposed to break off. A couple extra ounces of aluminum aren't gonna make these that much stronger that magically the chassis is gonna break instead of that. Sure enough, there are a lot of people that uh, the comments have just been beyond helpful. A lot of people that work on race teams and whatnot that have secretly reached out. A lot of you guys know who you are that uh, have been giving me great guidance. So I very much appreciate that. And I'm going in blind aside from your help. So thank you very much. Okay, well obviously this isn't the correct idea on uh, how to assemble and disassemble a chassis like this. We're gonna be reaming these holes out a couple more thousands so we get better 
fitment and allowing it to locate a little bit better. And I always knew that these things had steel sleeves because if you look at the mounts again, the, in my pictures, there's a fourth millimeter extra space where there's like a steel washer and then the washer is like pushed inside of here. So that way all this doesn't get ball up the aluminum. So I, I designed it so that way it would be fixed in later versions. Okay, we are one bolt out, Ooh, two bolts out, three, four, there you go. Now this would be a super magical moment if we hadn't started with this. For those of you that want that fast punching main bullet points like Donut Media does very well, I have my friend Isaiah here to help illustrate the facts here. So this is a flat plane crank. Flat plane crank! It is 14,500 RPM. 14.5K RPM. And it is 2.65 liters. 2.7 liters, because we always round up. Oh, we could keep going on about this motor, but I want to basically tell you how we got here. I bought that car and this motor separately. We've just test fitted them together, but we have a methanol tank that we know nothing about. We have a motor that we saw random bolts and stuff sitting inside of, so it's time to take this motor apart. The next two to three minutes are going to be a real quick kind of overall of what is on this motor. And this is even for me a refresh because we've had bits and pieces here and I've learned a lot since even the last video. Everything serves multiple purposes. Everything has two things or three things. So for example, something as simple as this valve cover cover, it's the coil on plugs. You have this thing right here at the very tip top center. If you watched the very first video on this car when we bought this motor, had no idea what this was. This is a fuel pressure regulator and it has fuel line in, fuel line out, and then air based on boost pressure to regulate the amount of fuel. So these things run at about 60 PSI of fuel pressure from what I've learned from some of the former executives and engineers on this team. This box right here is the CDI that stands for capacitive discharge ignition. There's a capacitor inside there and it, poof, it pops uh, every time it goes. So this has two inputs. There are not eight inputs. And so it is a twin distributor setup. One wire controls all four. Now this is a flat plane crank motor that makes this much easier because there's a thing called wasted spark and we'll get into all the higher details of that there. This was called a pop-off valve, which before I was trying to understand what POVs stood for on what these are. The pop-off valve was the only way that they really regulated this motor team to team. So this pop-off valve was basically your blow-off valve and that makes sense that it was way up here, away from the exhaust, shooting what could have potentially had methanol inside of it from the pre-turbo methanol up into the atmosphere away from the motor. This was something you did not want to fire off. And so they had sensors to watch when it was getting close to opening and all that. These four things up here are oil, fuel, boost, and water pressure sensors only. There's tons of wires. That is not indicative of what they do. I thought that maybe they had multiple purposes. They are just pressure sensors and I have the wiring for that and we can calibrate those. All the motor electronics go to here, 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 and here. This side is actually way more complicated. It's got your cam sensor, your crank sensor, your throttle position sensor, as well as a ninth throttle body. There was one electronic throttle body back in this time and it was on the very front of this motor. Oil temp sensor, coolant temp sensor, one of the half of the injectors, all on this side. Some of the really cool things that start to show up or as soon as you pull this whole unit right here. This is an individual throttle body setup. It's got these beautiful little trumpets inside of here. This under here is really amazing. This is all part of the throttle body setup and there's the throttle position sensor. There must have been underneath here some sort of damper. So when you rev it and it pulls back because there's springs on there, it would slow it down because otherwise mm -hmm. And you can see the fuel rail underneath there. So the fuel rail is only O-ringed to the intake manifold, all of it ends up coming from here to that thing on the top of the intake manifold. Everything else is essentially what you'd call like hardline. 16 injectors, two injectors per, as I say, rotor, two injectors per piston. We are down to what looks like a pretty standard V8. At least it looks way less intimidating in my opinion. We've got a couple major things that we need to know that we will be finding out throughout this video. Here's the flywheel. That is 5.125, so five and an eighth inch in diameter. That's the whole flywheel. They barely make these flywheels anymore. Tilton and some other companies, AP, I think. This also came in a four inch clutch, which is absolutely insane. The whole point of having a really small clutch is that the moment of inertia, smaller means that you can spin much faster and make sudden uh, RPM changes. That means it's a pain in the ass to drive. The other mystery that we're gonna be working on is the alternator. Look at how small this alternator is. This alternator does not put out 
a simple 14.5 or 14.6 volts. This thing is running at a much higher voltage and is not regulated. Instead, this is the line to the alternator. It has a regulator built into the Cosworth stuff. We are going to reverse engineer this and figure out how to control this damn thing because it's still just a basic electronic piece. But until we get to some circuitry, I think we can still control it. So we've got coolant in and out, coolant in and out on both sides. We've got oil here. It's a dry sump, meaning that there is no oil underneath the motor. It's pulling a vacuum, which a vacuum on a piston engine is a very beneficial thing, increases performance. There's air outlet and oil outlet, which is, means that there's some sort of separator. We're gonna confirm that into here. And then this is where the oil's probably fed in or sucked into the motor. This is really deceiving. Out of this comes a little quill, hex shaped thing with two little wings on it. Those wings, when the motor is buttered back up to here, match up with two hooks on this end. And there is a mechanical pump supposed to be inside of there. Now I have loosened this up. This is part of the fuel bladder. See how it sounds kind of rubbery? We have no idea the condition of the methanol fuel tank. So I've taken all these bolts off, which is generally a boring process, but very therapeutical right now. And we are going to see what's behind circle number one. Wow, that is, that's an aluminum chunk of metal right there. There's a lot of stuff going on inside this tank. This tank basically is very wide and tall, not very deep, but they have multiple corners of hoses. I think there's four of them. And so this is actually a bladder. Uh, it's a Kevlar, I don't know what other materials are involved, but it is a full blown, like rub, like think of it like rubberized bladder. Oh yeah, that's the O-ring right there. Is that the methanol that does that to the things? Yeah, so you're supposed to, I'm, I'm probably getting tons of cancer right now, but you actually flush all of the methanol out and run regular gasoline to neutralize what it would do to all of these hoses. But I mean, we're talking 97, so. They're meant for like anti-surge, like a surge tank, basically. With that out of the way, we now know what the tank looks like. We can put some light in there and see more. I'm gonna figure out all of the fuel pump there. It is time to start taking off the easy parts of the motor. I have already taken pictures of the clutch and measurements. This is a five and eighth, as I said briefly, and I have sent them off to Tilton and some others to see if we can get a clutch for this. Isaiah, if you want um, to get the 12 point out, we're gonna pull that flywheel off. That one wasn't tight at all, oops. Yeah, that comes off, with it? Yeah, I thought that was gonna be a bearing puller moment. Yeah, I, I did too, that's exciting. I just, I just didn't have that badass Milwaukee back then, you know? Yeah. What is this? There's a hole to here and this is vented. So there's gotta be something that went in that hole. Oh yeah. <laughs> there we go. That is, that's at least four inches. This is, that's this the only is, measurement this I got. is six. It, yeah, this yeah. is average. Yeah, that's the entire flight. Now we're gonna take these bolts Isn't out. That looks like a six main seal. Okay, so we got these bolts. That's oh. a pretty fly wheel. <laughs> I hate that I, that was I, funny. Dude. I know, I know. <laughs> the good news is there is a locating spot that way we don't mess this up because look at this that's the trigger wheel right there oh wow at least as far as i understand with piston engines because they take twice as long to do the same combustion suck bang blow technically this is equivalent on a rotary engine to being twice as accurate so you know when you think of number of teeth actually how many teeth is this we'll, we'll skip this one because that's the extra tooth one 12 that'd be like having a 24 tooth thing on a rotary engine this feels eight pounds you think eight? That's heavy. What is he smoking? I feel like three. Anybody that has, you know, like buys and sells rock knows <laughs> this is a, I'm gonna say 350 grams. Since we don't have the little 50 pound and under scale readily available, we're gonna weigh me. And uh, I would like this information redacted. 195.8 plus the flywheel, 199.2. 3.4 pounds. Is it 3.4 pounds? 3.4 pounds, yeah. Holy shit. With all of that off, it's got me wondering, do you guys know what this thing is? It's connected to the crankcase. So I'm gonna guess like a pressure regulator or something? I don't know. It, it's four bolts, you could take it off. Or uh, we could do that. <laughs> it's a real cool rule of thumb for using bolts. A lot of the, the mechanical holding on uh, engines of this type are actually not Loctite, they're yeah. mechanical yeah, lock. Right. And so, on modern engines, what they'll do is they'll use the mechanical lock first, and then they'll take it off once, and when they put it back on, they'll use Loctite. Loctite. And then if they see a bolt and that they take off and it has Loctite, they throw it out. So it's got uh, two lives 
and that's it. That is something I've learned about this motor over and over again. You wanna know how strong this is? Look up the strength of the bolts added up. Everything on here is the minimum number of bolts needed. And so that's essentially how you figure out the strength of something based on the fasteners they use. Oh. Wow, you got oh. O-rings. That's the reason we took this all apart is the we washers. sell tons of the washers and O-rings. I don't even know what those go to. It's hollow, so it's gotta be some sort of like vacuum regulation. Oh, look, at there's like a, is that a filter? Is that a filter in there? Oh, yeah, it is. Is this the Could oil that, filter? I was... No. Where would you get it replaced? Do <laughs> you think that they put Fram on this thing? Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> this gets my rocks off, uh, yeah. honestly. We're not busting open secrets, but it kind of is. Like, this thing has three holes. Same. One. <laughs> I was trying though, no, I was trying, just like our videographer Joel. <laughs> Babe, if you're seeing this, I miss you. Yeah. <laughs> There's some sort of inlet, and we're, because there are two outlets on the back, we're under the reason to believe that, that look at that, that little one right there is another inlet or outlet. And it's also an O-ring right here. Yeah, right look at yeah, it's that. it's O-ringed on that side. This thing amazes me that they put a lot of trust into one O-ring. Like that, that's, there's yeah. so much stuff going on, it's just one O-ring and that's it. Oh, you see, O-rings again. O-rings again. <laughs> okay, that, that is a mechanical filter of some sort. I wonder what track that is. <laughs> I hate everybody. This is even a custom uh, open-end wrench that we got for 7 mil, which is on this car, and that's even too small. Now, it requires a wrench because look at this. You can't put a socket on there. I want to show people this. For those like myself who aren't very big piston guys, there you go. There's that half moon thing I was telling you about. What you're basically trying to figure out is which position the motor's in. Between the camshaft and the crankshaft, you can tell it's out of the 720 degrees, which is two 360s, which of those two are you on? A bill from Lola Champ Car was telling me that you can run it without this, but it has to guess, and so it can be putting in fuel at the opposite time of when it's supposed to, and so you get the nastiest backfire. This is definitely an oil distribution block, and he took the one off the front that would go to the turbo, and this one it doesn't go anywhere other than to the sensor itself. Proper race engines, you're supposed to have it where all the sensors are isolated from all the vibration, especially intake manifold pressure sensors, as I've learned. Make sure that those things don't uh, vibrate. Wow. Oh yeah, look at it. It says uh, turbo oil feed. So good thing that uh, it's adding up. Joel said this, is that this is like, and it's for Christmas time, it's an advent calendar, except behind each one of these are probably nightmares. What's behind me? Ah, oh, it's a bolt. I was hoping for a bolt. It's a bearing in there too, no? Yeah, that's a bearing, a C-clap, circlip to hold the bearing in place. After some uh, off-camera discussion, we thought that this was way too easy, so we got bored and we're like, okay, let's sw swap to the other side. No, it's, if the motor's got problems on this side right now, we got way bigger problems. So we're gonna go to the more crazy side, which is fuel pump, oil pump, drive, alternator, all of that is all figured out over here. And so I need to get the alternator off. I wanna know what these lines all go to. All of that is found out on this side. So we're hoping, and I'm sure there's somebody watching this going, Dumbass, is that I'm hoping we don't have to take the heads off to do this. There's O-rings. Oh, there we go. It is just, o -rings in there. just look at that, just yep. long enough. And these. Yeah, those are connecting rods. <laughs> they're just O-ring O-rings. On the inside, that means that they're double, double O-ringed. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was your dream. Well, so I guess those didn't have to come off, so these don't have to come off either then. Because like that, that doesn't, oh, go, doesn't really go to anything, yeah. Oh, look at that, it's holding, look at that. They're all connected to something. I'm not going to do those anymore, because those that might be something that's held on on the inside of that. Yeah. They do that a lot on this motor, where there's like an O-ring, and then there's a shoulder that holds the O-ring in. Like the whole intake is done this way. That whole plate holds the whole ITB setup. Down. Down, you just adjust how hard down you want it. Curious to see if this plate's the same size as the one on the other side. There's a drive to this, and then that's the shaft for the like water pump and alternator. That's that shaft right in there. But there's nothing serviceable other than there's this key right there. Oh, it's not hex, it's square. Yeah, so that square right in there is gonna stick out and have two little propeller teeth that talk to <laughs> the rest of the chassis. It feels like something maybe in here is holding. This is probably my finest mature moment of my life, is that instead of yanking on it, I was feeling to see, it felt like it was cinched somewhere in here, and sure enough, there was a hidden bolt head right there. 
<laughs> yeah. So no need to, especially on the flat surfaces of that. Now I'm gonna, before we move it anymore, this is a very big moment for us. That's gonna happen. This is the uh, most controlled engine teardown I've seen us yeah. do. Usually it's chaos. It is pure chaos. So I, well, I guess what we'll do is, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> it I've been, the word chaos has been my word this week. <laughs> you just agreed though. I agreed, I was like, yeah, man, that, that's a really You're good. right, Joel. Joel, man, that, I've been saying. I'm just gonna get pure internal oil. With collecting just even more of this oil that is pretty solid sampling, it's important to know that when you're doing mass spectrometry or anything like this, and I'm not a chemist, but I do understand the basic concept, is that really what you're doing is lighting it on fire in a real fancy way. You're putting tons of energy into a small sample and recording the different wavelengths that correspond to different elements. You do that repeatedly. It's, it's, you need a, a little bit of oil to do it because you light it on fire and this time it showed some zinc. This time it showed this. And so you're basically saying out of the, whatever, let's say 10,000 times you tested, 1,000 times, 200 times, X number of times you saw these wavelengths show up. And that's how you get your approximate parts per million. It's really cool science. We're gonna go ahead and send this off to Valvoline and see what we need to do with this motor. So, just gonna... That's so tight over here. Yeah, it's pivoting off of somewhere in the middle. So we believe that these triangle things that are all connected to each other are still required to be taken off because they got tight as we pulled the front cover off, so. No, same thing. Same thing. Okay, those weren't necessary to take off, so we're Maybe gonna... Maybe these C-clips? Oh, I didn't even notice that one had that. Oh, I was looking at these two. Didn't even notice that one. So, these two... Huh. I'm gonna go ahead and remove these. Oh, there we go. My side's off way more than it ever was. Okay. Yeah, there's a big O-ring, so we just have to be careful with how we do that. Okay. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> that, I held on for dear life, because my hand, look at that, it's covered in oil. We definitely didn't have to take these off. Are they all the same? Yeah, they're all the same at least. Well, so Except what that was, was was these needle bearings right here. Yeah, we did that just right. And Jesus Christ. That is beautiful. And look at this. We didn't trash the O-ring at all. That's a huge O-ring. And that is a huge win for us. That is a big moment for us. This is already a, a chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. This has two different yeah. types of bearings in there, which is insane. But yeah. this itself, something crazy is going on in there. There's chaos yeah. going on. Inside yeah, that, that definitely. This is cooling in and out to the heads. That's cooling in and out to the pump. pump. This has to be either coolant or oil. I can't tell yet because there's an oil pump down there, but that might not be used. It might not go all the way here. So we have the main line into the block, and then there's two out. This hole might go to the air separator and slash filter. <laughs> Where you see. Is this whole drill? Yeah. Yes. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So that, so that is a, a filter. Filter separator. slash wow. separator. And that just goes to literally half the block just, yeah. just to do that. This little hole right here doesn't O-ring to anything. And so I was looking at it, it's connected into this area here, which I know is a distribution block. That sprays oil onto the whole gear assembly here. For all those of you guys wondering when you see the advertisements from Valvoline with me holding gear chain around my neck or timing chain, not so uh, off base now, is it? I certainly know that Valvoline <laughs> will take care of all this really well. I finally got a valve timing chain, gears, valves, sockets, pistons for Valvoline to protect. We are back, it's the morning, well, midday, and I have been bothered by one very small issue that is a big issue for this motor. Why would you have to pull this entire assembly off and then pull these gears off just to get to the alternator or the water pump. There's wires tucked in here. This doesn't seem like something you'd have to take the whole motor down for. And sure enough, the drive for that motor down to the alternator is removable from the front. And now we can take this whole assembly off the side, which it's now loose. So what gave me inspiration for this is that I noticed that this piece could push back a little bit and then it would come up to this ring and I realized, okay, that's a C-clip. And so I popped that out a little bit, right? There you go. Huh. Popped out right there. And then that allowed me, 
This is like some sort of like nuclear waste storage. So this is the adapter that allows you to run some front pump. So this goes from the spline inside of there to dented on the floor to a square shaft to the front. Now this one is just flat because there was nothing in there. So then I was like, man, that didn't change anything. I used this tool and kind of raked into there uh -huh. and I felt threads. And I was like, what the hell? So, okay, this is the M3. And so that's what's locking. When you undo all the bolts to pull this off, this is holding this and this, even this way as the last piece. Oh, wow. That kicked my ass because I'm like, there's no way that these brilliant engineers would have it where you had to disassemble the motor further than this to take apart auxiliary side pumps and alternators. So this puts us in really good shape to take the alternator off and study the shit out of that thing. So we're gonna take this off, this off, this off. And I've already taken the two brackets off of the alternator previously while I was trying to figure anything out. And wow. There you go. I knew that there'd be some sort of drive chain right there. Well, gear, whatever, whatever you want to call this. Axle. <laughs> so this is the water pump in and out. So just like the four rotor where there's an oil pump driven to a power steering pump and so on, that's kind of how this is driven here. But the one I'm really interested in, that is the entire alternator. From what I understand, this is a very high voltage alternator allowing you to carry more power through the same thickness of wires because 50 amps is 50 amps, but if you have 50 amps at even higher voltage, well man, you can carry that 50 amps even further. This is all so insane. Like, see this bracket has holes so that way you can mount it to the chassis, but you can't get it out without taking the carbon. This is all a super sequenced process. So at least now we can start to spin it by hand, pin things out, see if we can find any part numbers or anything that references beyond Cosworth. Damn. Rock tight? Yeah, superhuman strength tight too. I think you're right about it. But there's nothing on there. Oh, there's a little bit. I don't know. All of this is the entire oil scavenge system. This is not like coolant system on this side too. Even though there's radiators on both sides, it just passes through a channel right in the front. So we'll probably get some oil leakage on this as well. I made sure to make sure that the hockey pucks are not on that system. They're just resting on the block itself. So this isn't under pressure. So there, that's a good sign there. Oh, tons of oil. Tons nice. of oil. Nice. There we go. We'll dig into this much further in a second, but we need to clean up a mess. Isaiah just went out to McFadden and got us a six mil box wrench, whatever the correct adult term is for it. But we had to shave it down because it was all like crazy. Yeah, it was weird. While we wait for the rest of the engine to drain. Oh my God, the front end of the oil scavenger system is pouring oil into the ground. Can't wait. You all get that. Yeah. This is like, to me, a TikTok. Like what did motorsports engines use back in the late 90s as an oil filter? I'm gonna assume it's spring loaded because see how it's opening without me? It's a Pandora's box. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be chaos when you open it. Uh, no, Joel, I don't see Fram written anywhere here <laughs> yet. It's like a cheese grater. Oops. Oh. Cheese grater? Yes. Sometimes it's better if we just, just don't acknowledge. You don't know what a cheese grater is? I don't know how this looks like a cheese yeah, grater. I, I have no idea. You'll see. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, uh, I see, okay. I don't... Understandable, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Joel. This is exactly what I was trying to do with the three-rotor filter-wise, and uh, we are not a motorsports company. <laughs> Paul Aerospace 19 cleanable. Cleanable? Oh, nice. <laughs> I had a hard time reading the word cleanable. <laughs> Serial number, blah, blah, blah. I wonder what 19 means. Maybe uh, micron? micron? Yeah. Because look at that. Look at the filter. It, it, that's a nasty filter. So we've kind of cracked the code here. This is the oil inlet, and that oil inlet simply goes to the back here and is looped around. And then once it goes into there, 
that is actually the center of the filter. This filter filters from the inside out. That is backwards from a lot of what I'm used to. The oil pours out to the outside edges. And the outside edges include this hole right here. And that also includes that really small hole out there. That, that little hole is filtered oil. So that means that there's an oil pump still in this motor somewhere. This has actually caught our attention. I originally said, hey, there's a coolant in and out, coolant in and out, but that doesn't make sense. Coolant in and out is just here, and you don't need two sets for this. So I also remembered that earlier the oil was leaking out of this side from these two here. So with this spring in place, it's making me wonder if this is an oil pressure regulator or uh, the oil pump, considering the place it is. So Isaiah's got the air compressor, and we're going to test this a step further. Nice. Yeah. So that so is the, oil. This in... is the oil pump. Right? Yeah, that, that's the oil so pump. So then right that there. means that your other one should go to here. Yes. So go ahead and blast me. <laughs> faster, faster. <laughs> <laughs> that cl very clearly means that, that this is oil pump with regulator. Then oil in. This is oil pressure out. Okay because this goes up to the top to the filter and then distributes the rest of the way. Yeah, so then oil in, there must be the internal regulator that like bypasses it back to inlet. So this comes from the bottom of the sump, which is the lowest part of this right yep, here. Yep, yep. But then that, all, that passage also goes to the middle block, which I don't know, what, what, could, what could it pull from over there? Yeah, and it definitely doesn't pull the uh, scavenge. Scavenge has to get out. It's not connected even though it's all inside the block. We're gonna open this up real quick. So that one makes sense. That's like a little turbo in there. That's a coolant one. You're surprisingly or not surprisingly enough, that's the coolant side still. Oh. So it is this one. And then that one. So there you go. Vacuum here, pressure out to here, and then it sends pressure out through this piece, right? Mm -hmm. But inside is that hole, and that hole is the oil pressure regulator dumping it back into the suction side. So that spring right in there which oh, is yeah. adjustable here is the oil pressure regulator built into the pump. So it took a little bit to figure this out, but the pressure put onto this piston draws the piston down. All the pressurized oil is going into these three veins here, but that's just for structural rigidity. But you start out and it starts to bleed a little bit, bleeds more, 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 and then it opens up. It kind of accelerates how much based on the spring pressure. That shape is very specific to this motor or whatever their intentions were with oil pressure. It is finally time to begin cutting down the core of the block. And so we're going to take this off, and I already know just from pictures I've seen, it's gonna look insane here. So our plan of attack is see the insanity inside of here, take off the tops of the heads, and then gently spin the motor after we verified everything's okay, and see this motor spin and watch all the valves move and just get a nice idea firing order, all of us. So we got a lot of reasons other than just making cool content. The very first thing that makes sense to me is to take off things that are in the way of your thing. So we're gonna go ahead and take off this camshaft synchronizing thing. At least we take off the camshaft synchronizing bolt. <laughs> so there you go. Um, is it directional? There's nothing on this thing that shows you uh, well, I guess all it is is either on or off, right? Yeah, it's on or off. Yeah, look at that. It doesn't. It doesn't have a. Oh, uh, it just went in and that. Yeah, but look at see it spins, and that's not the. I'm not spinning the camshaft. I guess that's okay unless you lined it up on accident, where this line was directly between the two phases or something like that. Because what I'm thinking is. It's either yes or no. Yeah, it's it's, it's either yes or no. It's not a position um, sensor technically. I guess I'm just gonna start loosening all the, the outer profile. You know how hollow that is? It's already ready to go. So maybe if we pull the black headed uh, bolt out. <laughs> what the Whoa. heck? Look at that. What? That's a shower, not a grower. <laughs> so does that make that side? Yeah, so uh, we'll try taking this one off too. Okay. We should have the same weird, yep, same weird bolt. Oh, oh geez. Wow. That is nuts.
clearly not an expert in this, but the teeth all look in good order to me. Like it's yeah. nothing sticking out horribly wrong. Nothing looks bad. Yeah. That's nuts that this is all spinning 14,000 RPM and then, you know, the ratios from there. The one guy out there that's watching this that has only worked on rotary engines randomly has never for some reason had to touch a piston engine, like myself. Let me show you a little bit about what it, this is. That is where the flywheel bolts onto. And so this is the crankshaft. This is equivalent to the eccentric shaft in the center of the motor that goes down and all the pistons connect to. So this is where all the torque is sent out to the flywheel and then you know down to the wheels. That is sending timing really that, hey, gear to gear to gear, and then to this chain, both sides here, these four are camshafts and they, have, they control all the valves. So intake valve, exhaust valve, intake valve, exhaust valve. These are not variable valve timing. What timing that is on the uh, camshaft is what you get. You know, you'd have other wild shit all over here. You've got tensioners, you've got extra pulleys, you've got all that sort of stuff. I don't know what this central piece is. Everything is all gear and chain driven. So you really don't have much variation in the timing of these. It always cracked me up because I'm like, yeah, technically, you know, there's a little slop, but at the end of the day, it's clearly effective for almost billions of motors. But yeah, this, this is both chain driven and gear driven instead of like uh, on my old Pontiac Sunbird, it was a belt driven motor. <laughs> so the timing belt was a belt, meaning rubber, which broke and then now your valves don't move and the engine's trying to spin and you can't get air in or exhaust out and of course your motor grinds to halt on the valves they do push down to open and so if the piston's coming up and you have the timing of this wrong they should hit you'll see like the indents of trying to give you just enough clearance because they've got this is insanely high compression ratio you're talking about compressing a big volume or in this case a very small volume it's an insanely small volume and that requires you to have those pistons and those heads very close. If the valves are in the wrong spot at the wrong time, you trash your motor. That is, just like my buddy Ari said on the live stream, one of the honest reasons why rotaries are superior to piston engines. I don't think they are superior motors overall, but they have none of this. All the port timing is just built into a piece of steel. <laughs> so <laughs> you're good. You're solid. This is the upper chassis <laughs> we're taking off. Now we're going to be taking the valve cover off. And what is mind blowing to me is that when I made these, I made these with as much precision as I could. And when you look at it from the backside, you understand why those bolts are so much deeper. They don't go into the valve cover. They go into the head, the edge of the cover being held down to the head. And that's actually done with the engine mount which is the chassis and that's why uh, on this side they had left these two and we'll put those two in there because that corner of the valve cover is not supported we're gonna go ahead and take all of these off and see what lies underneath Uh, somebody lied to you guys. Somebody, I'm not gonna say who, but somebody lied. One more. Crazy. I told you guys. There's one more. There we go. No valve cover gasket. Valve cover o ring. There we are. Wow, those are tall. I don't even have to know much about. Valves no ring, that's a O line. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most expensive part of the motor to run. Not only is the piston hidden underneath there, but the valve springs, which you can't even really see easily from here. You can the see valve this would be underneath right underneath here, here. Yeah, the valve springs are four thousand dollars at least as of ten years ago, which means they're more expensive per set, and they run and last only four hours. This motor costs over a thousand dollars an hour of idling, running, performing per hour. It's over a thousand dollars just in valve springs. There's a guy named Bill who documented a lot of his adventures, bits and pieces of this. And he actually has a set of the two intake cams that they've grinded about 10% of this lobe off. He's gotten up to 20 hours out of his motors just by decreasing the aggressiveness in the intake cam. That does make a difference to performance, but just add a little bit more boost. These are O-rings in here too. And those sleeves. It's hollow in there. Look at that. Well, that, that's the uh, spark plug. Normally they're not hollow like that though. The, the oh, middle, the hollow side to side. The yeah. middle of the head is hollow. 
Oh, that's some weight savings right there. Reading the timing of the motor, these are the two ports for the exhaust and this, they both open at the same time. It's, it's all side by side. They're all the same exact timing side by side. I don't know enough to say if there's motors that have anything different, but it's just nice to see what you would think makes sense, makes sense. With this being the source of oil to spray onto all the tickers, the things that make all the knocking noise. This is another smoking gun for us, is that you see those little holes there? That implies that the center of these camshafts are hollow. Pressurized oil is sent to all of the bearings. The normal like LS sprays it up in there and you're good, but this clearly has oil pressurized feeding these bearings, especially with how fast these would be going. It's kind of wild to see the combination of how things are lubricated in this motor, because that's the drain right there. As I showed these guys, there's there's a, a bolt under here that we do have to take these off. I, I should have listened to you. I know. Uh, I actually... <laughs> oh, look at it bent the shit out of that. Hey, that's okay. Test. I, I could fill up with welding for remachine. <laughs> I am not remachining these things. There's so many small moving parts that one nut falling off will ruin your entire day. What I've noticed is something that I don't even have to take the bottom end of this off yet to confirm what I thought would be the case with this crankshaft. If you notice, this one is pointing this way. This one is pointing the exact opposite way. This one's pointing up, this one's pointing down. So what that means to me is that these two pistons are going up and these two pistons are going up, and so they are firing at opposite times. My current theory about the firing order on this motor, which if you see, like, there's people that sell shirts that's like one, eight, seven, blah, blah, blah. That's an LS firing order. This is not an LS. But with this being one, and this being five, which is also weird to me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I thought that they went this way. But it goes one, five, which makes sense, 90 degrees later, and then two, six and then four eight because remember it can't fire this one next because these two are connected so it's got to be this one something and then this one so it's one five two six four eight three seven one five that's insanely efficient there's no weirdness to this it's left right left right it's meant for business. And there are some negatives to flat plane cranks. We'll get into all of that as we learn it, but uh, the positives are very clear that they're very much smaller and sound ridiculous. I am going to put some of the flywheel bolts back on and I wanna spin this just slowly by hand and watch everything moving. All of these parts, all these parts, including the pistons on the inside, which maybe we'll put a little bit of oil in there. <laughs> this stuff's way cheaper than the motor itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You started that. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, no, 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 Everything back here will all be moving, so it's it's really cool. Which way does the motor spin? Now, there's a couple ways to figure that out. One is by guessing. <laughs> Two is by knowing that the firing order is one, five, so that means that you can look at the lobes and figure out, hey, which way does it rotate? The other way is we can actually spin the wheels, watch which way the input shaft spins. So we got a couple different ways of figuring out the rotation of the motor. You can hear it. Yeah, that is a lot of doesn't like that way. Well, I don't, I don't think, I think it's gonna be the same either way. Yeah, it hasn't moved in however long. I think, I think that, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a lot of force required to move it though. Remember the guy was saying since we left it sitting? Joel was just mentioning uh, something that actually the guy from Mountain, Ken Anderson, I think is his name, uh, general manager at Mountain, was like, uh, yeah, how long has that motor been sitting? You're not supposed to let these motors sit long because if that camshaft is pushing the spring down, these springs are so pushed to their extreme already that they'll basically form memory and it'll be way less effective. So you're supposed to like every like three months or six months or so, I don't know the actuals, but you're supposed to rotate the motor uh, to prevent things from having a specific memory. But 
The only memory I have right now is that we just spun the motor over for the very first time. <laughs> this is where this stuff gets exciting. So there's a lot of hearsay. There's so many, just like when I bought the Diablo, finance the show, Diablo, it was the clutch, the clutch, the clutch, clutch. It's like a legend, the whispers of horror. And so on this motor, the legend or the whispers, again, that the valves, valve springs are insane. So what we just did real quick off camera was saying, okay, well, these look basically the same, right? Well, let's measure them. So this is the intake cam and we're measuring it as max and we're at 1.49 and change. And you know, we, we don't, we're not exact, but that's five thousandths off. So we'll say 1.5 inches. So I was like, okay, well that, that's gonna be this, right? Nope. That is 1.45. So it's 50 thousandths smaller. That bill that was offering to sell me his intake cams that he ground down, technically they're basically the exhaust cams because he said they're 10% less these are one inch wide with an extra half inch lift off of that. So that's 0.5 inches. 10% 0.5 is 50 thousandths. And that is how much smaller the exhaust is. So it's the intake ones that really trash the intake springs as far as you know what we're getting to. We're, we're looking at some serious science here that if we came across another set of exhaust cams, and Isaiah was saying that they do that on Miatas. Yeah, I forgot which one exactly it is, but you pretty much, which I was telling them instead of buying ground down cams because one thing you don't want to do when you're buying cams or you know sometimes they weld them sometimes they grind them down but these are like heat treated and actually kind of really brittle they're not meant to be moved in another way yeah. so you try to not do anything yeah, his, with his are heat treated because they have to be mm -hmm. so there's valve float and all this sort of stuff that i don't know exact science is behind but i understand you know the, the youtube version of it but to think that this thing can run to 14,500, almost 700 rpm as designed that is insane technology. Since this motor is so specific and everything used to service it is actually almost just as much, if not more specific, we have to make a very custom block engine mount. So check this out. We found that there are three M12 175 volt holes hidden underneath this cover. And it's very clear that that's the center of the block. This comes off, the heads come off, the whole bottom splits like right here and goes off. So this is clearly what you want to be holding on to when you're building the engine from the absolute ground up. And with that, I found that this bolt hole in particular was a little bit less deep than the other two. So we kind of had to match them. And since there's not too many options of bolt lengths, I took all 90 millimeter long bolts and took a couple threads off of this one and made it as clean as possible to have these little two inch extensions to get away from these gears because you have to have this cover off to get to this anyway so the biggest problem is this gear here and even though the plate won't be in front of it spinning it around you don't want it to hit basically going to weld those onto a plate that bolts onto this plate instead of dealing with all the harbor freight stuff tack weld these onto there so it's like always used just for this motor what i've realized is that the race teams probably had a engine mount that was an exact height that was also the same height as the stands for the transmission so once they got this in they slapped that side all together put that back on you're not using anything harbor freight when you're a race team you're using exacts this carb was meant to be lifted the exact height so nothing variable could occur you could just slap it together so that's kind of what i'm trying to do in that spirit so you see that custom piece all set up for the very center of the block and then isaiah made this custom piece it's funny because we spend all day working on these things and none of it's actually the Indy car. So this piece turned out really well. So we're going to go ahead and put the flywheel back on and uh, use that as the correct surface to apply torque to this motor. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go for it nice and slow. And it is funny because last night I multiple different ways verified the, the engine's rotation. It's the same as a rotary engine. I'm just go back and forth a little bit and you can see the slop. See that? I think that's, that's all the, I mean, gears naturally have some level of play. Almost everything does, but it's wild for me to see that. We're going to go ahead and remove the spark plugs or at the very least loosen them. So this one I've already taken off when I was inspecting the motor. This spark plug is a baby. <laughs> Looks like something you'd find in a weed whacker. A weird looking tip. I'm curious to understand what temperature that these plugs run at. A lot of questions. And now that we know exactly what goes in here, we can check that out. So this is what we normally use on the rotary engines. 
give us a little bit more control over this with all the spark plugs out. Oh. That was loud to see. It's something that like sticks and then lets go. That's that's what it's gonna be. Yeah, it's tight here. I see it, I see it popping up and over this. Tensioner. This is under tension now. It's loose here, so it has to do with a cam like holding back and letting go. It's something along those lines. It's tight here. Yeah, it's interesting. Are we skipping teeth? <laughs> no, it's doing on both sides. It's literally fighting the peak of the camshaft. So I'm not too worried about that noise at this moment because it, it actually kind of makes sense. We don't have a bad motor or anything. This is just incredible. It's no surprise to me that it takes a little bit of work to rotate by hand, just because you have so many mechanical interactions. Gears on gears, chains, cams, pistons, piston walls, all of that stuff is always going to have some level of friction. That's awesome, but I think it's time to show you guys my crankshaft. With all the ports blocked, I feel much more comfortable completely flipping the motor upside down. These are all the physical screen filters for the dry sump. Everything about this race setup is impressive. They purposely put these on there to be replaceable, clearly serviceable, but they're also like, hey, if we blow the motor, let's keep the pump safe. They have as many filters as we do on our system, but they just have them in very strategic places for race reasons. Just the simplest beginning to this. I'll go ahead and look at one of these little screen filters. And there you go. King of the castle. At the end of the day, this only will filter large things out. This is not filtering, you know, micron small stuff. So you're not gonna see a literally a collection of much in there. So we're gonna keep those in there. What stands before us is kind of the most disruptive thing that we could do to this motor because these are torqued to specific value and they are a very, very critical part of the block. Everything else is still critical, but this is the center. In my opinion, I would be voiding the warranty of however this engine is assembled if I took this part off. Everything else covers or covers, you know, and accessories or accessories. So I'm a little uh, nervous about this moment because I don't want to take this off and then leave the motor open like that for long. Since the smallest torque wrench we have is a 3 8 and it goes down to 12 foot pounds or so, now that's not accurately reading the amount of approximate force that these are under. Now these are gonna be probably in inch pounds. We don't know the exact torque on these. We're gonna go ahead and look up the seven millimeter bolt nut requirement, you know, SAE type information, and uh, go off of that. That makes this even scarier. <laughs> I wanna point out to everybody that's watching this, cringing or whatever, that they have the right to cringe, and I'm well aware of it, because at this point we have undone what somebody professionally has done. YouTube doesn't wait. We're not trying to move fast and break stuff on this. I just gotta recognize what it is. So I'm not going to be taking these off. I'm just going to be loosening all of them. They're definitely not just hand tight. Like you can feel they're very consistent on their amount of torque. So we'll have to get a uh, like quarter inch torque wrench so we can get these to the correct consistency. All of those are loose. We're gonna go ahead and hit this row. We are in fact tightening them because we were looking for that click to say, okay, it's not moving, it's tighter than that click. And so we are in fact going to tighten it a little bit when we finally find the correct amount of torque and then say, okay, it's approximately in that range. Okay, so it's less than 20. So that's 15-ish. It's starting to move around there, so we're gonna say 15-ish. The big ones, these are the scariest part of this motor. And we're gonna stick with the 3.8. Yep, 20 clearly is not uh, enough. We're gonna go up to 25. Going up to 30 pounds. I'm switching to a different one just so I'm not. Okay, 30. I'm switching it just so I'm not like accidentally tightening each one more. There's 35. That moved just the slightest bit. Let me verify that on this one. 
Yeah. So I'm going to say 30 just because time and money. <laughs> you don't go to a billion because they'll start stretching the bolt itself. Same thing here. These are very specifically meant to be a certain number. Enjoy the next couple seconds of fast forwarding through pulling all these bolts off. We'll slow back down from the main ones because those are just so important. There are washers on these, I think. Just reviewing everything, looking at all before I put any sort of pressure on this, I was like, this just doesn't make sense. Two here, one on this side, why would it be lopsided? So I was like, let me just look at one of these and actually this one's in a uh, oil pump and return area. It, I felt in there and sure enough, hidden underneath this, look at that. Oh, wow. oh, wow. The reason they blocked at least two of these off is because th this is the oil pickup here. There's one bolt inside of that oil pickup, there's another bolt in that oil pickup and then it goes into the oil pump. That's crazy that, that, again, the oil pickup area has actually got bolt heads. This is such an efficient motor. It blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. That's gratifying. Now with all of those other bolts out, this one got tight again. Oh, that one, no, that one got tight. Now that one got tight. These were loose just a second ago. Oh, you can see it lifting, kind of. Oh, yeah? This okay. one's so tight right here, too. Yeah, look at those fat washers. I wonder what the reason for fat washers are. All of these bolts are all loose and off, and you can tell that because the whole thing has risen. We are going to transplant this from here straight over onto the table. And the reason why is we have 10 washers that we can't get to, so we don't want to have like tons of different things going on all at once. I'm going to assume this gear stays, which should be better, and then these will just kind of ride up as they come up. Oh, it's doing it. It's doing exactly what I thought it would do. That's nice. Oh, that's oh nice. I, I really okay. Nice. Don't, you don't look at it. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. All I gotta say is that felt really nice. That did. That the, felt amazing. The, the bottoms of those studs have to be machined. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, thank you for coming to this video. Oh. Oh. Ho, ho. You look. Oh, sorry. You didn't, oh. you didn't look back. Mom, I didn't. I, I, Santa, I didn't. See I haven't Santa. even looked. You, okay. You sorry. Look sorry. I didn't look. I didn't look at all. Oh, I looked again. Oh, it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful. Uh, you guys want to look on three or? Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah ready? Don't. Ready? Okay. On three. One, two and a half. Three. Holy Whoa. moly. <laughs> so they call this a girdle pretty much. Yeah, it's, it's girdling. It's, I knew that this was the case from studying this, but there are two pistons on each lobe. So there's only one, two, three, four lobes. And that actually makes the ignition system and everything else so much easier. And what you can see is these middle two lobes from this angle are at the exact same spot. Most V8s like LSs are actually, one lobe is a 90 degrees, one lobe is 90 degrees, one lobe is 90 degrees. So these are flat, meaning that if you set this on a table, they all line up that is on one plane x-axis of you know y-axis z-axis whatever one look at how small the counterweights are the crankshaft is between the last shot and this one i saw joel poking around the motor <laughs> and he dropped one of these right look at this this one's missing so thanks to joel that is now inside of the motor just so you guys know my name's joel <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh what is this and it fell out of my hand and went right into the motor Thankfully, it's on the backside of the skirt of the piston, but we're gonna go ahead and collect these and set them away because even to turn the motor upside down, these would all fall out. I've seen something like this before in pictures. No idea what it is though. We're gonna go ahead and flip this back upside down because I noticed that there's a lot of the nasty oil laying on top of the pistons and my little piece has to come out. Okay, so there's gonna be tons of oil coming out because it's actually from the motor hanging upside down. And hopefully uh, a pellet. That oh, a that's a thrust, thrust bearing. Yeah, it's a thrust bearing, but that's great that it fell. What are you looking for? Oh, it fell off. Yeah, I, I, I grabbed it. The good Lord giveth, the good Lord taketh away when it comes to dropping things in the motor. R means R, right? <laughs> we want to flip it back over. <laughs> yep, so we're going to go ahead and flip it back over <laughs> while we're at this very tense moment. Do you want to put this guy back where it went? That guy went back right here. Okay, yeah, because thankfully Isaiah had just gotten done explaining what these are. Bronze side towards me. I will let you. So the bronze goes on the outside. Stay, please. Everything looks good. That's the good news. No scorched bearings on here. And we're actually gonna be able to see the bearing material over on this piece. And there is some beautiful sludge and Babbitt bearing material. And thankfully, 
No copper colors. That makes me happy. There's a little bit of extra wear right there. Huh. And there's weird wear on that one right, right there. But again, no copper. The things that Valvoline has taught me about bearings is everything is so much simpler than you think it is. And at the end of the day, it's always gonna be simple because it's cheaper to make it. These bearings, this outer layer is like soft metals, like aluminum, not to say the aluminum's in there, but tin, anything that's a very malleable metal because that gives you a little bit more room before you then get to the copper, which is still a soft metal. Uh, and then you go steel and steel and you ruin your party. The whole sump is meant to suck yeah. it out, like the angles of everything. So this one clearly goes to the piston one and five, two and six, three and seven, four and eight. We do know that the oil is sucked in through the back here, or at least just fed in, and then it's just sitting in this section, but that is not the sump. This is the oil pump in, and then oil pump out, and that, we assume, goes through here and somehow goes up here. So we're gonna go ahead and test that by putting this over that and air into there. That is the beginning of pressurized oil through the block, at least pressurized from a oil delivery. The other side actually ends up vacuuming and pressurizing a little bit. Well, there you have it. I've shown you my crankshaft, so please respond. <laughs> <laughs> that is every bit of the Cosworth XD exposed that you can, other than the pistons, and we'll get to those at some other point. But we now know exactly what we're dealing with, and this is the moment that the build begins from right here and goes outward. So every video from this point on is adding to the car, putting it back together, and eventually doing a test fire, doing a full idle, running it. Each of those phases actually takes a lot more work, but we're trying to haul ass through it.